Thank you all for watching and special thanks to the conference organizers and to H Friends for making this virtual meeting possible. The work I'm discussing here explores the connections between French and Portuguese student activists through the 1960s, particularly in the run-up to the events of May, June 1968. This research grows out of a larger question about cross-border human, human rights activism and how Portuguese migrants in France affected local rhetoric, strategies, and action. I'm interested in the emphasis on publicity and awareness raising within human rights movements through the 1960s. But this project has also led me into questions about what we today would call allyship. That is, the ways that solidarity movements understand their relationship with the more vulnerable. The crux of my argument this morning is that these French and Portuguese students understood themselves as part of a global and transnational movement with shared enemies. French students looking to Portugal and elsewhere insisted that authoritarianism anywhere was a danger everywhere. So French students started to pay closer attention to their Portuguese peers in 1962, following both the founding in Paris of the French Committee for Portuguese Amnesty, the FCPA, that, that was in February of 62, and following a wave of student protests from March to June in Porto, Lisbon, and Coimbra. That December, the FCPA hosted a conference in Paris, and one of their speakers was Jean-Claude Rohr, president of the Union Nationale des Étudiants de France, or UNEF. Hur, like many of his students, initially understood the Portuguese situation as a parallel to Francoist repression in Spain. He likened the Portuguese regime's recruiting of youth to Hitler and Mussolini's fascist tactics, insisting we cannot, as young people, accept it. Quote, we must fight in whatever country we find ourselves in against this forced submission of youth, because if we accept it elsewhere, there is no reason it won't be imposed on us at home. End quote. Hur's plea for youth solidarity suggests a deep sense of obligation that superseded national boundaries and forged a shared struggle in generational terms. One important step, Hoare explained, was that UNEF had decided to organize a conference on behalf of Portuguese and Spanish students and against fascism, quote, with our comrades from all the countries of Europe, whatever their political and social regime, end quote. The attempts, mostly failed, uh, to organize such a conference further highlight UNEF's position on transnational solidarity. The plan for meeting with representatives from all of Europe was stemmed by Cold War tensions. It was difficult for Eastern and Western European student groups to cooperate or even really to agree to show up in the same place. UNEF insisted that, quote, only a truly representative conference can provide effective support to, Panish, to Spanish and Portuguese students, end quote, and they rejected proposals by other national delegations for simply expressing support bilaterally. UNEF's position was grounded in the assumption that student political action needed to cross and even question national borders in order to affect real change. Moreover, their insistence on full European participation came out of the concern that any meeting that weighed heavily toward the socialist East could actually be harmful, given that both Franco and Salazar had a propensity to discredit any opposition with the charge of communism. UNEF's emphasis on solidarity was shared by the Union des Grandes Écoles, or the UG. The UG's April 1968 Congress in Cannes affirmed that, quote, university problems are rising in all the countries of Europe to varying degrees of acuity in the same terms, end quote. French students' growing awareness of Portuguese students' protests and their oppression led them further down the path of this transnational solidarity. French students were also quick to connect Portuguese fascism with the ongoing colonial wars in Africa. Rohr invoked the role of Angolan students in his 1962 speech as a crucial part of the struggle against the Salazar regime. Speaking for French students, he acknowledged, we, quote, we had the experience of the Algerian war. Only this process of decolonization gave us the basis to install a real democracy at home. There is thus a succession of struggles between democratic Portuguese who want a free and democratic regime and Angolan patriots who themselves want to be liberated from the colonial regime that still oppresses them, end quote. Its invocation of Algeria both created a further parallel between French and Portuguese students, and it served to remind Rohr's French audience of the ugly and unpopular reality of France's most recent colonial war. 
1966 UNEF Congress in Grenoble passed motions on both Portugal and the Portuguese colonies, even as it acknowledged its members' responsibility to oppose continued French colonialist policies in the Danton and to protest the ongoing Vietnam War and South African apartheid. Here again, these were recognized as part of a single global conflict in which UNEF's allies were the oppressed fighting for their rights and their freedoms. The motion against Portuguese colonialism captured the sense of solidarity and accused NATO countries of being complicit in the colonial wars by providing military aid to Portugal. In this way, the students aligned themselves not only against Salazar's regime, but also potentially against their own state, and this is a move that really foreshadowed the rhetoric that we see in 1968. The motion on Portugal, echoed at the following year's Congress in Lyon, directly coupled the Portuguese government's domestic, quote, reactionary policy of misery, obscurantism, and repression, end quote, with its, quote, war of repression against the people of the Portuguese colonies fighting for their national independence, end quote. At this point, it's important to, notice, to note that this engagement by French students was not one-sided. Portuguese students, particularly those in France, actively solicited support from their French peers. Humberto Lucas spoke as a Portuguese representative at both the 1967 UNEF and the 1968 UGA meetings. His role was particularly informative. His remarks cataloged the Salazar regime's unjust treatment of students and of the greater population. He also provided inspiration to student militants by listing the array of repressive tactics turned against Portuguese students, all while declaring that none of these succeeded in breaking the resistance. By 1968, he spoke more fervently about the need to make stronger and more frequent connections between the UGA and Portuguese students, particularly at the Instituto Superior Tecnico in Lisbon, quote, so as to breach the wall of silence that the fascist regime imposes on this country, end quote. He cited a statement that had just been issued by student associations meeting illegally in Lisbon that proved, quote, the path of student syndicalism as the most appropriate path for the stage in history and serves the deepest needs of national life, end quote. The shared invocation of the need for solidarity movements was furthered by their demand for, quote, integration into the international community of students, end quote. As much as French student activists proclaim the need for joint action, Portuguese student leaders link their own success to their ability to mobilize across national lines and to capture public attention to pressure the regime from outside. French and Portuguese students have forged another important link in their activism, the link between the university and society at large. This idea would of course be central to the 1968 attempts to merge student and worker movements in France. Students in Portugal advanced claims about the connection between their frustrations and the state of the nation throughout the academic crisis that began in Coimbra in 1962. As part of their strategies for garnering international attention, some students sent a pamphlet in English to select Lisbon embassies in which they declared that, quote, conscious of our rights, both as students and as men, with regard to the university as to the Portuguese people, we will not abandon our struggle, end quote. Clearly, the students understood their position as intertwined with the fate of Portugal and the world community. Following this line of argument, Horst remarks to the CFPA's conference later that year emphasized that for students, quote, as intellectuals, it is our task to show that these regimes, because they oppress intelligence, because they oppress self-expression, are a brand on the human spirit as a whole, end quote. In a world where human rights frameworks rest on, rested on civic rights to thought and expression, the question of free thought and instruction within the universities was far from academic. A new series of student protests swept to Portuguese cities in 1965, partly as a response to the trial of three students who had been arrested the previous year, which was a stark reminder of the potential costs of opposing the regime. This wave gathered a fair bit of momentum. Demonstrations grew in size, Families of detained students began their own public campaigns, and international press attention added to the pressure. This forced the regime to plead its case in the public sphere. A Ministry of Education communique in March insisted that they had an obligation to, quote, protect the values to which we owe obedience as a Western and Christian community, end quote. Portuguese governmental arguments recognized the students' claim to social solidarity and made numerous attempts to sever any sympathies that students were able to cultivate. In addition to invoking the values of order and respect, the regime accused students not only of communism, which was a habitual refrain, but also of a policy of uprooting themselves from the social soil, creating the universities as a space apart, accessible only to a certain class of students. At the same time, the Ministry of National Education insisted that universities had full autonomy from government intervention, except in cases where multiple universities were implicated or where they strayed beyond the, lim the quote, limits of university activities, unquote. In other words, even as the regime worked to cut ties between the students and the population, the repressive response was justified by those very connections. 
Portuguese student groups countered these charges directly. A tract responding to the assertion of values retorted which values? The value of the police capable of shutting down divergent voices? The value of torture as a means of obtaining confessions? Members of the political opposition still in Portugal also responded to the 1965 protests by drawing parallels between the students and society. Police force used on the streets to quell demonstrations was linked to broader political violence, like the use of force within courtrooms. Students' demands for democratic pedagogies were part of the fight for the freedoms of critique and of information. Moreover, the government's reliance on repression and, quote, reactionary fascism, end quote, to suppress student demands was proof that the regime was, quote, incapable of resolving the fundamental problems of the population, end quote. Groups on all sides of these protests thus perceived the students' actions as resonating far beyond campus regulations. This was also the case Umberto Lucas made in his addresses to French student congresses. After setting up the regime's attacks on university freedom at the UNEF Congress in 1967, Lucas explained that the policies towards universities were, quote, but a reflection of the current situation in the country, end quote. In April 1968, he described the ways that student associations in Lisbon demanded not only pedagogical democratization and reform, but also fundamental liberties of association, press, and expression, and building off of those, the right to strike. The UGA agreed that curricular reforms were central to social change because, quote, all instruction has the sole goal of forming an elite devoted to Salazar's fascist regime, end quote. This concern about the ways national education could actually prop up the regime surfaced again in the protests in Coimbra in May 1969, where students opposed a set of academic reforms on the basis that these were intended only to improve national profits and thus strengthen governmental power. By the time we arrive at May 1968, these trends of transnational activism and connecting school to society were on clear display. French students rallied around both ideas, soliciting support from foreign students and workers in France, continuing correspondence with student movements in other countries, and asserting the resonance between university and broader social issues. UNEF materials from May 68 insisted, quote, the radical contestation of the university is inseparable from the contestation of established power. Indeed, the university struggles only have meaning when integrated with the struggles of the whole." End quote. Tracing port individual Portuguese students' engagement in the massive events of uh, May-June of 1968 is a little bit challenging given available sources, but what we do know is that the Portuguese house within the Cité Universitaire in Paris, in Paris was one of the hotbeds of political activity. In late April, Portuguese students in the CDU helped to organize protests at the USA Pavilion and at their own, initially to challenge rules about allowing female visitors into the residences. These protests included calls of down with dictatorship and down with fascism. The Paris police were quick to assert that the meetings were, quote, only a pretext permitting the Portuguese students to publicly mark their opposition to the Lisbon regime and the official Portuguese services in France under whose control the Portuguese, students res Portuguese student residence functions. End quote. Flyers from the April meetings fittingly declared, quote, we have had enough of police paternalism, end quote. It's important here to acknowledge the presence of the Portuguese secret police, the PIDE, within Paris. The local police post in the Cité Universitaire was also conveniently close to the Portuguese residents, making those students doubly vulnerable to surveillance from both French and Portuguese state forces. The Portuguese residence was occupied by a revolutionary committee, which included Portuguese students in June. A tract from the Revolutionary Committee emphasized the international makeup of the occupiers. And while this is unsurprising for the Cité, which housed many of Paris's foreign students, the need to assert this level of cooperation aligns with the long-standing bids for solidarity across national borders. Among the goals outlined by the Revolutionary Committee was demonstrating, quote, the active integration of national minorities in France to the just struggles of progressive students, of the working class, and of the French people, end quote. Their occupation of the Portuguese and Brazilian residences in particular signified their attack on, quote, the fascist or militarist regimes that reign in the countries of origin for these pavilions, end quote. Their denunciation of, quote, the hold of the totalitarian embassies over these pavilions, end quote. And finally, their desire to, quote, demolish networks of political espionage and fascist nuclei. The administration of the student residences became, in this context, an extension of Portuguese state control, including the presence and effective force of the regime's police. For students in these CDU pavilions, opposing regulations quickly became a direct confrontation with the regime. Lisbon and other Portuguese university cities, however, were notably quieter than Paris in the spring of 68. Students from Lisbon's Technico did publish posters inviting Portuguese students, quote, to show solidarity with the French universities and workers who are courageously fighting against the police in the streets of Paris. Quote. 
UNEF pamphlets were also in circulation. France's ambassador to Portugal, whose reports over the years suggest some sympathy for the student protests, insisted that this relative calm should not be misinterpreted as acquiescence. Rather, he remarked, quote, repression has been efficient, end quote. The regime's reliance on academic expulsion, imprisonment, and especially the threat of forcing students into military service in the African colonial wars had managed to tamp down Portuguese students' public opposition since the outbursts of 1962 and 1965. Though Portuguese students felt empowered to hold large protests against the Vietnam War in front of the U.S. Embassy, public opposition to Portugal's own wars was too difficult in the face of both public opinion, which still supported the empire, and the brutal regime. These explanations of students' inability in Portugal to participate in the wider events of 1968 remind us of an important caveat to the regular invocations of a shared global struggle. Students directly under the Salazar regime face significantly greater personal danger than the French students did. Even Portuguese students within France were subject to greater surveillance and potentially harsher penalties for their actions. Charles de Gaulle was not Salazar, and if students believed that they were all part of a transnational generational struggle against power and authority, they also understood that the stakes were not the same everywhere. To their credit, most French students involved in these movements acknowledge this difference. UNEF reports recognized the Portuguese students' struggle could in a real sense be one of, quote, life or death, end quote. Part of their role as allies was to publicize the government's repressive tactics, to name the students who were arrested, to warn about recruitment by the PETA, and to call attention to torture and sleep deprivation within political prisons. In this, student activism dovetailed with emerging human rights movements similar emphasis on increasing public awareness of state crimes as an important part of their own arsenal. Ultimately, this realization that certain populations were far more vulnerable to state violence and oppression reinforced the role of cross-border solidarity within student movements. Students who benefited from more open public spaces and who had stronger protections for their own rights believed they had a responsibility to fight for those who could not. These ideas were not, of course, the sole purview of Portuguese students and their allies. Leftist politics, communism, syndicalism, and other strategies for collective action were woven through these students' politics and their practices. Yet Portuguese students had a special place at the heart of human rights movements in the 1960s. Famously, their struggle would provide the founding myth for Amnesty International. More concretely, student and worker activism in Portugal increased all the way through the 1974 Carnation Revolution, which made Portugal itself at least for a moment, a center of internationalist ideological moment. Throughout the 1960s, French and Portuguese students were thus an integral part of an early transnational activist movement that drew explicitly on the rhetoric of universal human rights and employed strategies of transparency and raising public awareness. The students' understanding of solidarity went far beyond a network for swapping strategies and ideas. It was rather an ideological foundation for a generational cross-border struggle against oppression in any form. Their solidarity was both a means and an end. It crossed national borders as, as readily as class, professional, and even racial lines. These core assumptions about shared values, shared needs, and shared enemies then animated much of the events of 1968 around the world. 